Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm with Alex Halliday, who recently guest edited an issue of Philosophical Transactions A on the origin of the Moon. How old is the Moon? So the solar system, judging by the ages of meteorites and other and debris that land on Earth from outer space, is about 4.5 billion years old, 4.6 billion years old. Um, there's evidence that pretty much all objects about the size of the Moon formed quite quickly, maybe within a couple of million years. But new chronometry using tungsten isotopes um, was developed over the last 20 years. And that has allowed us to take those lunar samples that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts and determine the age of the Moon using tungsten isotopes. And that shows that the Moon has to have formed at least 30 million years after the start of the solar system. So however the Moon formed, it wasn't part of the original material that was swirling around the Sun. It formed tens of millions of years later. Some people say even maybe 100 million years after the start of the solar system. And that limits quite strongly the kinds of models you can consider for how the Moon can have formed. When did scientists first begin studying the origin of the Moon? So one of the most, you could argue that the start of modern astronomy really came about with Galileo when he actually uh, constructed a telescope and started producing images of the surface of the Moon. And that very important set of images showed that the Moon was not a perfect sphere, but actually it had a rugged surface to it and was actually sort of had mountains and, and plains and looked actually more like the Earth than a perfect sphere. And this immediately uh, raised the prospect that actually the solar system wasn't quite the way people had been thinking and that maybe there were connections between the Moon and the Earth in terms of how the two objects formed. And one particular person who was important from the point of view of Wadham was John Wilkins, who became the Warden of Wadham after the Civil War. And he and uh, Robert Hooke basically came up with ideas about how to actually travel to the Moon and what one might find if one went to the Moon. Now, in later times, there are a variety of theories proposed for how the Moon formed. Um, in particular, um, uh, one of the Darwin family came up with the idea that actually the Moon may have formed by spinning off from the interior of the Earth. In other words, he thought that the Earth was once a rapidly spinning molten ball, fiery ball, and the Moon sort of left the surface of the Earth and this was still being knocked around as an idea when I was a kid. Uh, I remember reading about this as a teenager being interested in geology uh, in the 1960s. And there was an explanation for the origin of the Moon that it came out of the Pacific Ocean. Of course, in the 60s, we were discovering that actually the Pacific Ocean floor was actually very young and not ancient at all. And uh, this theory didn't make any sense in terms of what we now know about the geology of the Earth. It doesn't make much sense either because it's dynamically very difficult. Uh, the Earth would have to be spinning so fast to actually have this material leave the surface that it would have been completely ripped apart uh, by the forces. And so uh, that theory of fission has not really been uh, regarded as very popular. In the 1960s, 1950s, uh, other theories came about, and in particular uh, Harold Urey, who was a Nobel Prize winner. Harold Urey got very interested in the whole idea of the origin of the Moon, and in particular was very keen on the idea that the Moon was captured as a wandering planetesimal that happened to be going through the solar system and got caught up in Earth's orbit. This is also quite dynamically difficult, um, but it's very... Um, now that we've got samples back from the Moon, it's particularly hard to reconcile with the fact that we can show that the Moon formed late. Um, everything else that's the Moon's size that we've been able to get samples of uh, formed very, very early, within a couple of million years. 
and yet the moon formed at least 30 million years after the start of the solar system. So you, you can't really explain the moon's origin that way. Um, the other thing that's very hard to explain uh, with Harold Urey's model, the capture model, is that when you measure the proportions of different kinds of atoms, or isotopes as we call them, in uh, the various elements in lunar rocks, we find that there's a striking similarity between the ones in the moon, in other words, things like the isotopic composition of oxygen or chromium or titanium or tungsten, those isotopic compositions are identical in the Earth and in the Moon. And so that suggests that um, somehow the atoms that are in the Moon either came from the Earth or they, they uh, came from an area where the Earth came from, so the material had the same kind of provenance, or alternatively, there was some kind of mixing of the materials that formed the Earth and the Moon. Can you briefly describe the giant impact hypothesis for us? In the late 1970s, um, Bill Hartman, uh, who was one of the speakers at our conference, um, and uh, one of his colleagues, Davis, basically proposed that actually maybe uh, a series of impacts affected the Earth in the early history of the Earth and some of the debris from these impacts then accumulated into the moon. While this uh, was seen as quite an attractive idea, there were some problems with it. And one of the main problems was that at the time, people saw one of the most interesting features about the moon was that A, it was extremely large. It's bigger than any moon uh, in the solar system relative to the size of its host planet it's disproportionately large. So it suggests that something rather special has been involved in its formation. The second thing that was quite striking was that um, the, the, the Moon and the Earth spin around together. Most of the angular momentum in that Earth-Moon system is in the Moon's motion itself. And people thought that this probably meant that however you form the Moon, you had to explain that angular momentum and the motion of the Moon around the Earth. And so that required a rather special kind of thing, not just a bunch of uh, small impacts, but potentially one major impact that actually gave the Earth and the Moon its spin uh, as a result of this big collision. Uh, this led to uh, what's called the giant impact theory of lunar origin. Uh, which was first really put together in the 1980s. So it all makes perfect sense as a giant impact theory. And everyone was very excited about it. The, the dynamic models for the giant impact theory involve an object about the size of planet Mars colliding with the Earth. And those theories had the, in order to produce the spin of the Moon around the Earth and the Earth rotating, you had a, an impact that was a glancing blow. And so it would come in with a glancing blow. This planet would be about the size of Mars, about 10% of the mass of the Earth. Most of it would go into the interior of the Earth. A little bit of debris would be left outside, and that would coalesce to form the Moon. And these have been simulated with a technique called smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations. And it works very, very well, but there's a problem. And that is that while the simulations produce a moon, you can trace where the particles come from that end up in the moon. And most of the material that ends up in the moon comes from this other planet that is impacting the Earth. And I just explained to you that the isotopic compositions of all the solar system are highly variable for some elements. And so you would expect, therefore, that the moon would actually look different from the Earth if most of the atoms come out of this other impacting planet. And instead, the Earth and the Moon look identical. And how do new developments in research challenge and support this hypothesis? Because of this paradox about how can you explain, uh, or problem rather, as to how you can explain uh, a Moon forming giant impact with a planet coming in with a glancing blow if the atoms look the same between the Earth and the Moon. Um, some new models have come about. 
A new model was proposed um, in 2012 by a group at Harvard that actually the, the, all this angular momentum wasn't a result of the giant impact at all, that the Earth was already spinning incredibly quickly before the giant impact happened. And if you do that, then you don't actually have to use a glancing blow to produce the moon. You can actually hit the Earth head on, produce a pile of debris. The Earth is already spinning. That debris gets spun around. And so you end up with a lot of debris coming out of the Earth to form the moon as a result of being hit by this other planet. And if you track where the particles come from, indeed, most of the material that winds up in the moon comes from the Earth itself. So this was a completely new model. Instead of it involving necessarily a planet the size of Mars, it could have involved an object that was as small as 2% of the mass of the Earth. There was another model proposed by Robin Canop from Southwest Research Institute, and uh, that involves, uh, uh, says, well, actually, maybe if you can relax this constraint of the angular momentum, uh, you could actually have a range of sizes of impact. Uh, and she explored the idea that the Earth and the impacting planet may have actually been almost the same size and collided with each other. And as the Earth and the impacting planet get to be closer and closer in size, so the relative proportions of those two objects in the Earth and in the Moon get more and more similar. And so the mix ends up becoming indistinguishable. So there's another new idea. Both of those models have problems in terms of getting rid of the angular uh, momentum. How will the field progress in the next 20 years? Uh, we actually asked people at the conference what one thing they would like to see happen to really uh, make a difference to the field over the next 10 to 20, 30 years. And the one thing that kept coming up more often than anything else was a sample of Venus or a sample of Mercury maybe um, to actually tell us what the inner solar system was like uh, beyond the Earth going inwards. At the moment we've got a very poor idea of that and uh, getting material returned from either of those two objects. In the case of Venus it would probably have to be a sample of the atmosphere. Uh, in the case of Mercury we could potentially get something back from the surface in 10 to 20, 30 years time, that would be transformational, just like getting samples from the moon was transformational. Thank you very much and thank you for watching.